I've talked about this before and I actually had a girl recently DM me, which is what then inspired me to do this episode. Obviously I've lost weight, right? I'm not going to beat around the bush with that. I've lost weight. I was this size, I would say before my ski accident. For those of you that know, I had a really horrendous ski accident a few years ago, 2017, that put me in a wheelchair for three months. I then had the following four surgeries from that ski accident. I had to learn how to walk again. It was a very, very traumatic time, not just physically, but also mentally for me. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode. For any new listeners here, my name is Monica. I'm here with my two doggies. Well, we have four, but Butter and Jelly join us for every single podcast episode. You can't necessarily see them or hear them, but sometimes you hear a little like jingle in the background from their collars, like a little cow walking through. It's hilarious. Um, Okay. Today we are talking about a really important topic because as we see all of these new and like God knows what's coming in the future, these new weight loss drugs and quick fix solutions on the market. It's really important, in my opinion, for us to get clear on what actually creates health long-term because drugs are not the fucking answer. And what things you can be doing if you do want to lose a bit of weight. And I want to say a few things that I've said in previous episodes before where I've talked about weight loss. It is not self-hate to want to lose weight if it's coming from a good place. Obviously, if you are wanting to lose weight because you hate yourself, because you think that you're going to be happier at a smaller size, because you think that people will love you more if you are, you know, if you can fit into a size zero, whatever it is, that's not healthy. Okay. But I do want to mention that there is such thing as healthy weight loss. If you know that your body is carrying extra weight, if you know that your body is not at its full health and at its body, your body's healthy weight and equilibrium, then losing weight and desiring that is actually, in my opinion, a form of self-love. And this is a really important topic for me to bring up because we are seeing, and maybe some of you have, have you know, been tuned into this conversation, we are seeing more and more of this quote unquote body positivity where we have obese people on the front cover of magazines or obese influencers eating donuts and saying that this is self-love and that this is what's healthy. I want to make something really fucking clear. If you, if your body is sick because you are obese, which is not healthy. Let's make one thing very clear. Being obese is not healthy. We all have different body shapes and we all come in different sizes. Yes. But being obese or overweight because you eat sugary, shitty foods, because you have major thyroid issues as a result of chronic inflammation that you haven't fixed, because of trauma that you're not willing to address, but you decide that binge eating makes you feel better about yourself for that moment. And then you feel guilty. Like whatever the reasons are, obesity is not healthy. 70% of the U S is overweight. 50% are obese. That is not healthy. There is nothing about that. That is like body positivity. No, Body positivity, in my opinion, is about self-respect. It's about speaking positively to your body and allowing there to be balance, but eating shitty food does not equal balance, right? Of course, if you are in Italy, eat the fucking gelato. I say this all the time. Like when I'm in Italy, it's like every day we need our gelato. It's like medicine to us when we are in Italy or whatnot. One of the reasons why we're quite literally getting married in Italy is for the gelato, not joking. But When you go to Italy, for example, and you eat this gelato, I'm not eating three tubs a day. I'm eating two scoops after I've had a meal full of protein and healthy fats and fiber. So I'm already satiated, right? This is like this treat that we get when we go to Italy. The experience of eating the gelato is a pleasurable, fun, happy experience. I'm not eating the gelato because I'm sad and depressed. I'm not eating the gelato because I'm craving the gelato. I'm eating the gelato because it's part of the cultural experience of being in Italy, for example. 
when we see people in the US and now it's been released that dietitians are being paid by these different groups to promote really unhealthy food. Like yesterday I saw one, this dietitian was promoting, what's it called? Like easy Mac or like that craft macaroni and cheese in a box. If you don't know this, the formula for, I think it's Kraft macaroni and cheese in the US is different to the UK because half of the fucking ingredients are, in, are banned in the UK. Like ingredients that are banned should not be going in our body. Ingredients that have that a food that has coloring and flavors and MSG and vegetable oil that is known to cause catastrophic effects in our body and major inflammation and major issues, that is not body positivity or self-love. In fact, self-love is fully cherishing your body for the fact that it's keeping you alive every day and supporting your body. So self-love or self-respect is when you've had a really massive week, taking it easy on the weekend, having a bath, watching your favorite movie at 1 p.m. Like, yeah, cook yourself some healthy pesto pasta with chickpea pasta or good quality you know, pasta that isn't full of fucking flavorings. In my opinion, like eat the gluten, fine, right? That's going to give you a bit of inflammation per se, but at least it doesn't have vegetable oil. Like it doesn't, at least it doesn't have gluten and vegetable oil and colorings and MSG and God knows what else that is banned in other countries, right? So I won't go too down that rabbit hole because that could be an episode for another time, but I just really wanted to make it clear that I've done this work with women for a really long time now. And obviously I'm just continuing to, it's continuing to be longer and longer and longer as I keep going. And one thing is very, very clear to me. When I have women come to me that are overweight, that are struggling with their body, that are struggling with their food, it is never, the answer is never eating the food and giving into the cravings. That doesn't actually make them feel good about themselves. Often it makes them feel worse about themselves because they know it isn't good for them. So when we see this mass media and Instagrammers telling us that it's okay and that it's good for you to eat the donut, it's very confusing because our logical mind knows that if it's in a packet, it's probably not as good for us than if it was homemade or literally coming out of the soil. So for a lot of people, this new body positivity, it's creating this push and pull in their brain and this dichotomy of like, what am I meant to be doing? And it creates confusion. The confusion then creates more stress. It creates more overwhelm. And then you tap deeper into your trauma responses because you already have a pile of trauma there already. And what do you do to try and quote unquote, fix the issue and fix the overwhelm that you're feeling? You eat the food because you're seeking comfort. And so you now now go on a binge because the feeling of comfort lies in your stomach. And now you've eaten a whole pile of food to make yourself feel more comfortable. But 10 minutes later, you're shaming the shit out of yourself and you hate yourself. So when people are coming to me, the root issue is always something to do with a trauma response. Their symptom, the way that their trauma response is manifesting is in their relationship with food and in the illusion that they're telling themselves and the illusion is being supported by what we're seeing on Instagram. So just to paint the picture, you've got somebody with a whole pile of trauma, let's say from their mom, their mom you know, was constantly braiding themselves about their own body. And then they would put that onto their, their daughter and their daughter grew up in this culture of, I need to be dieting all the time, la, 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 la. So then they're trying to get healthy, but kind of from this fucked up place because they're trying to lose weight or whatever it is. They see on social media that, oh, it's okay for you to eat the donut. It's healthy. It's self-love. And they're like, oh, okay. If it's self-love, then okay, I'll eat the donut because I'm trying to go on this journey of loving myself. Then they continue to be more inflamed, more sick, more overweight. They have more brain fog. Now they have PCOS. They've got a whole host, host of hormonal issues. Oh, now you have Crohn's, whatever else it is. And the problem is, is that when you're on this kind of train of then eating the junk food, but you're doing it because you think it's maybe the right thing to do because it's self-love or because it's fucking balance, the issue is really now out of your control when the inflammation kicks in, when now you fucked your gut lining and those, the messages between your gut and your brain. And now, Baba, can you please stop whining? The messages are now disrupted and you're becoming moody 
and you've got this brain fog and you're thinking negatively about yourself. I'm hoping that you're getting the picture that I'm painting, right? Where when you're eating this bad food, the flow on effect isn't just you gain a bit of weight. The flow on effect is about your mood, your libido, your hormones, which then all affect your weight even more. So now you feel even worse about yourself. And this is why You know, when you create a really healthy relationship with food and when your body is in the place of it feels safe and when your body doesn't have inflammation in it, when your body is operating at its optimal level, you can eat some gelato, you can have some pizza and it won't throw everything out because either one, if you ate some shitty pizza, you're not going to feel too good the next day. So then you're going to already be wanting to eat healthy again to make yourself feel good. Or number two, if it's something like more sugar than you're used to. So for example, when I go to Italy, it's more sugar than I'm used to. No, I will not do that for a long period of time. No, I don't always feel fantastic if I eat a pile of sugar by any means, but Because my body is in a healthy place, it can deal with it more. My liver can actually detox it a little bit more, right? My gut has the kind of integrity where does it love it? No, but it's going to be able to deal with it. And I have the tools and the supplements and the resources to then kind of counteract that enjoyable experience that I had. And I mean, I can go on this forever because I don't want anyone listening being like, this is not a healthy relationship with food because you're you're saying that I have to be healthy all the time. This is why it's important because if you're thinking that, this is exactly my point. Having a good relationship with food and eating healthy gets to be something where it's not even a decision. It's not even I should. It's not even I have to. It's I want to. It's the only option for me. I don't ever think about eating healthy. I don't ever think about what I'm eating. I don't ever think about, oh, I have to eat these many vegetables each day. It's just my way of living. And when I'm traveling, I won't necessarily eat as many vegetables. When I'm in Europe, I am going to eat a lot more pasta and bread and sugar and carbs, but I still don't think about it because I'm in Europe and that's what I want to eat. So I'm going to eat it. But of course, if I've had a lot of pasta for a couple of days in a row, my body will naturally then want a hearty salad or fish and veggies. And it becomes something where your body guides you rather than your mind guiding you whether it's from an obsessive place that your mind is guiding you or whether it's from a restrictive place. I mean, they're both kind of the same or whether it's from, oh, I should eat this or I can eat this because of self-love. If you want to eat the gelato, do it because you want to eat the gelato, not because, oh, this is self-love. Does that make sense? Every I'm hoping this makes sense, everybody. You have to want to actually do it from this conscious place. And why this is an important distinction is because a lot of people, when they're eating sugary foods or when they're eating junk food, they don't even do it from this really conscious, I'm going to enjoy this. I'm excited for this, this kind of whole body pleasure experience. They do it from this place where they give themselves an excuse of why they can eat it. They basically tell themselves why it's okay And in you having to tell yourself why it's okay, that is what tells me what unconsciously you, that is what tells me how unconsciously you actually don't think it's okay. Versus if there's no thought process about it, that's actually what you want. You don't want a fucking thought process about the food. It's just what you're naturally doing and what you're naturally inclined to move towards because it's the natural way that your body operates now. Okay, so let's get into the topic of weight loss, like I said for this episode, we need to look at the whole body. So when you're wanting to improve your health or lose weight or get fit or heal your skin, whatever it is, you need to look at all parts. Well, that's my professional opinion anyway. The biggest thing that's helped my clients to get their health back on track is working on everything at once. They come to me, we do the health, we do the trauma, we do the healing, we do the mindset, we do the hormones, everything because it's all related. And like I shared with you guys before, the flow on effect from each of them is very, very real. It's a lie to be told that everything is independent of one another. It's not. It is very much dependent. Health and illness are the very physical expressions of your life. It's literally your past showing as the physical. So there's a few main areas that I thought I would break down for you guys that you want to look at when it comes to improving your health, whatever your health goals are. 
Guys, I literally have your summer plans sorted for next year. I'm so excited. If you haven't heard the fabulous news, I am bringing my three-day immersion back to New York City where it all started in 2019 for the first ever event, Never Not A Vibe. And I am crashing your European summer because I am doing my first Europe immersion event. I cannot fucking wait. I'm screaming, but I am not gonna scream down the microphone to you because you're probably not gonna enjoy that. If you have not heard the memo, if you have not gotten the memo, then you're probably not signed up to my email list, which you really need to be. If you didn't listen to the recent episode, which we'll link below on the kind of changes coming, then I would go and listen to that. The waitlist gets a $500 off code. So you probably want to click the link in the description right now before we get back into the episode and then you forget about it. And then you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that was this was happening. If you click the link below, you can sign up to the waitlist, but you can also get the dates for the New York City immersion and the Europe immersion. You get the prices, the everything, so that you can save the date, you can put it in your calendar. No one then gets priority over you and you get to have the best best summer of 2024 because you get to spend it with me and more importantly you get to heal your trauma and fully step into the most radiant sensual magnetic alluring abundant delicious woman that you could possibly imagine yourself to be so i'm so excited make sure your name is on one of the lists or both of the lists if you're thinking about coming to both and keep a lookout in your emails for all of the information as we start to drip it out to you guys. Oh, I'm so excited. The first one is energetic. So this kind of relates to the stress and nervous system one that I'll mention in a little bit. And I've talked about this before in an episode about losing energetic weight. So we'll link that one below so that you guys can watch it. That's also on YouTube, I believe too. Um, for anyone that likes to pr uh, prefers to watch it or needs the closed captions, please remember that people pleasers are those that hold the responsibility of others on them. They're so worried about how others are feeling about them. They're so worried about judgment. They're so worried about rejection. That is a lot to hold. It's a lot of fear to hold. It's a lot of stress to hold in your body. Now, of course, if you're a mother, slightly different situation, right? Because yes, you're pleasing your children, but it comes from a different place. It doesn't come from a place of if I don't please them, they're going to reject me or they're going to shame me or they're going to judge me. It comes from the place of like, I want to, like they're my children. It's a completely different situation happening in your body. But many people, they'll come to me and they will literally feel like they are holding years, if not decades of shit in their bodies. Maybe they don't even know they're feeling that, but then they'll, once we get into it, they'll recognize they, they'll feel it. Or from their intake form that I get, I'm like, well, this is an obvious reason of why you're struggling with X, Y, and Z. There is so much in safety, in security, in pressure, in fear of letting go, in control, comparison, anger, rage, feeling like they're not good enough. In all of those things, there is so much that you hold onto in your physical body and it adds up. In a study of men that had prostate cancer, they actually found that the suppression of anger was associated with a reduced effect from natural killer cells. Natural killer cells are an important um, immune system defense that basically just play out in your body. So they, you want natural killer cells. In previous research, the natural killer cell activity was reduced in healthy young people also in response to minor, minor stresses, especially key thing, especially for those that are emotionally isolated. So essentially what this is saying to make this in one sentence is that research has shown that when you suppress anger and when you have a lot of stress in your body, your body has less of a ability to fight off disease because your immune system weakens, especially if you're emotionally isolated. Now, since COVID, how many of us are emotionally isolated? A lot. When somebody is emotionally isolated, it's actually considered a significant source of chronic stress, which is interesting, right? Because you might not even think that. You may not even be aware but the reality is, is that you're not aware because you're on your phone all the time, scrolling Instagram, texting your friends, DMing people, like going on dating apps. And it's these constant hits of dopamine that keeps you going so that you can be completely oblivious to the fact that you have this chronic stress in you. 
this is why, or at least one of the reasons why we decided to make the LA events, because I wanted to give all of you an opportunity to have a one day event on a weekend. You don't have to take time off work on a weekend where you can connect with other like-minded women. You can actually create a sense of community where you can not only learn the best of all the things I talk about in a day, but you actually can have a reduced level of stress by the end of the day, possibly, if not very likely, make some new best friends because in every every event I've done, every single event, people have said to me that they've made their best friends now in that event, every single event. So you could very likely make some new best friends and at the very least have an incredibly uplifting, inspiring day and massively reduce stress that you're probably not aware of you're feeling. So if you're unhealthy and isolated, you have something that you need to look at stat, especially if you're struggling with your health, whether it's inflammation, whether it's hormones, whether it's weight, any of the things. Additionally, grief, which I haven't mentioned before, grief is another really heavy emotion that can manifest as physical weight in the body if it's not released. It's actually been shown through research that grief is linked to cancer. The study that I'm talking about showed that in parents that lost an adult son to an accident or military conflict, there's an increased number of cancers of the blood and bone marrow in those people. Also an increased chance or an increased um, level of lung cancer, skin cancer, and lymph node cancer in these parents. Another study, it was a Danish study, showed that grieving parents had double the risk of MS. Double the risk of MS. So to sum it up, Grief causes illness or cancer. I want to say illness. Grief causes illness because there's many things that happened before you even get the cancer. So if you're holding all of this grief, you've probably normalized it. You've probably learned to live with how your body's physically feeling. So you may not even know that you are inflamed, that you're hormonally fucked, that you have digestive issues, that you have brain fog. Because very often people don't even know how shit they feel until they feel good, right? So just know that if you, if you intuitively know I'm not at my healthiest, my body isn't 100% okay, just know that on the other side of healing this, there is so much relief, so much peace, so much concentration, so much productivity, such a high libido, so much vivacious energy. Just like I go on and on and on. It makes me so happy for you just listening to this, start to become aware of this. And let's be real. If grief can give you MS, it's probably going to make you gain weight, right? Because you're literally protecting yourself. Weight gain emotionally is about self-protection. So when people are struggling with this energetic weight gain, like why am I energetically holding on to weight? You are literally protecting yourself from something, whether it's being seen, whether it's because you're holding on to all this grief, whether it's because you don't want to let go of something, whether it's because you are chronically depressed and sad and you don't want people to see you like this. There can be a multitude of reasons, hence listen to that energetic weight episode because I go through that more in there. Not to mention, like I said before, that the flow on effect of often eating shitty foods is then not looking after yourself because you're so depressed and bogged down by the emotional crap that you may not be aware of it, that you may not even be aware of it. So you're not aware of it. You eat the shitty food because you feel like it. You're quote unquote craving it, which then puts you in this really vicious cycle because you've thrown out your physical biology, right? You've thrown out your body's sense of health. So now you are more depressed, more anxious, more stressed, more, you know, uh, harsher on yourself. You're talking more negatively about yourself because also of the food that you've been eating. I had a client the other day, one of my one-on-one clients. She just did, if she's, well, she's not fully ready to do a full sugar detox with me because we want to heal some stuff underneath addiction to sugar before so that she's fully emotionally and energetically prepared for it. But she did a 48-hour sugar detox and she was like, already, I've got no brain fog. I was so productive this weekend and my stomach never felt better from 48 hours. So even if just as a starting point, you want to just try this for 48 hours, right? And just eat healthy for 48 hours just to see what you notice. I will say you might just go into the detox phase though, which could feel pretty rough for some of you. Um, anyway, let's get on to my next point. So this brings to my next point. This brings me to my next point of this whole eating thing. 
The next thing to be looking at for your health is your physical health. So when I'm saying physical health, I want you to be thinking about what am I eating? What's my movement like? What's my inflammation like? What's my toxic load like? Those kind of things. So especially if you live in the US, you have to put more effort in being healthy, eating organic, not using toxic skincare or household products, eating good quality meat. These things are often minimized or just blown off or not talked about, but it is so, so important. It might be a little bit more expensive. You might have to pay a little bit more to get organic produce, but guess what? You're either going to pay in the food or you're going to pay in your hospital bill. So you choose. Speaking of which, you need to be eating enough protein as that is the building block for your DNA and your body. If your body is fucking starving, how can it be healthy? For those of you wondering, in the US, because this is taking me a hot second to figure out where to buy everything from, much easier in Australia. I get meat from Thrive Market, which is an online thing. It comes frozen and farmer's markets. I'll put the link below to my Thrive Market thing. I think you get like a $30, $30 like thingy off if you use my link. All my skincare and household products that I use is on my favorite products page. So you can go there to check it out. We'll also link that below. Cut out the sugar. Cut out the sugar. I've had so many of my clients being like, okay, get me off the sugar. And the change in their mental and physical health is quite literally astonishing. Get into exercise. Find something that you love and have that consistent practice, not just for your body, but also for your mind. For those of you wondering, yes, we're still a Pilates whore over here. And I use the Pilates class, which I love. We'll link that below. And I also use Bailey Brown's Pilates, although I'm loving the Pilates class more lately, just because they have a much bigger range of classes and the classes don't repeat themselves. They vary a little bit more. So those are the two. What I like about Bailey, Bailey's classes though, is she does have great low impact cardio classes, which is really fabulous for the ladies, fabulous for your uh, follicular and ovulation phase. If you don't like doing hit. I'm not really a hit person. I like to do more low impact. So that's on there. But the Pilates class is fabulous because they just have a really great range. And I find their classes a lot more challenging as well. So if you've done Pilates for a while, that could be great. I know that there are so many different Pilates options out there. So many amazing online platforms. So do your research. But those two, I love. Find a class. Get into your walks. Find a podcast. Well, you're on one that you love listening to. Every time you listen to one of my podcast episodes, you go for a walk at the same time. It's just about how can you integrate more exercise and movement into your day. Even just me picking up gardening, that's my exercise now on a Saturday. I'm out there sweating my fucking tits off. It's hot. I'm like digging shit. I'm picking up these massive bags of soil. I'm doing all the things. That's my, I get a full blown workout. My heart rate increases. My aura ring is like, you did a workout. Like it's fully aware of it. So find something that you enjoy to do for movement. The next thing to be thinking about, for those of you that aren't already aware of this, I am completely booked up for the rest of the year for all my one-on-one spaces, which is so exciting and just so amazing. So what this then means is that we are now already enrolling for those of you that want to do a mini one-on-one package or a one-on-one package next year. So starting in the second half of January, 2024, All you need to do to secure your space and to also get a super extended payment plan is to make sure that you filled your form in on the one-on-one page. And if you already have filled that in because you maybe inquired before, then just shoot an email to us. Let us us know that you're now in a position where you would like to secure your one-on-one space and we can organize that for you. So I want to make it really clear that for those of you that have maybe thought about it in the past, but you know you need a longer payment plan option, this is your time to secure it because I can add on four to five months onto your payment plan. So we really can spread out those payment plans and make it possibly a 10 month payment plan or even 11 month payment plan, depending how quickly that you join and pay. So the sooner that you secure your spot and you join and you pay for your place, the longer I can make that payment plan option available for you. I also want to let you guys know that because I have the book coming out next year, which is really exciting because I have our wedding also very exciting. I am going to be having more limited spaces in my calendar because I need to be able to give 100% to those of you that are in my diary and in my world. My diary is in my calendar, Uh, not necessarily my morning journal, although you never know. (laughs) So please just know to not wait to the last minute because I don't always have spaces in that last minute. It's much, much more likely and the majority of the time 
you know, when people inquire, it's about a couple months of waiting until we actually start our session. So this is the time to do it. You then know that you are starting off next year on the best foot. You've made that commitment to yourself and you will be able to get started with a bunch of pre-work before because of some of the inclusions that are in the package. So it's not like you're paying and then just left kind of like twiddling your thumbs. You will join and then you can get started in things whilst you are waiting for our first session to commence. Oh, I'm so excited. So for those of you that have been considering doing this for a while, now is your chance, especially with the extended payment plan option. And I'm so excited to have you in my world for the beginning of next year. I cannot believe we're already talking about next year. I'm making these little areas for you guys to look at just to help you to put all the pieces together, basically. So the next area for you to look at is hormonal. I guess hormonal is also part of physical, right? But I wanted to make it its own thing as well. So when you have estrogen dominance, which is often coupled with low progesterone, your body can be holding on to weight either because you're not detoxing the estrogen, right? Your liver is only one part of detoxification. And there are three phases even in your liver that it has to go through. So drinking some green juice isn't going to do shit. So either you're not detoxing the estrogen or because your body is making too much due to stress or the xenoestrogens caused by uh, endocrine disruptors in your environment, they're throwing things off. When you have low progesterone, you don't get that beautiful metabolism boost in your luteal phase. And often you just get fucking bloated, you get water retention and a whole host of other issues. So estrogen, you want to have a balanced amount. And then you also want to have a balanced amount of, of progesterone and not have low progesterone. A lot of women have low progesterone because of how stressed they are. Testosterone is also really important to look at. In men, the decline of testosterone is a very, very real issue. The other day, my fiance said to me, because now he's been heavily influenced by everything I talk about, he said to me, babe, I can just feel my testosterone raging lately. I just feel like I've increased my testosterone levels. And I'm sitting there and my ovaries are just like, bing, bing, bing. I'm sitting there and I'm giggling because I'm like so turned on by what he said. It worries me these days of just how low men's testosterone is. And, you know, at the end of the day, we can only do so much um, because we live in an environment that isn't exactly supportive of our health. That's the issue. And, you know, plastics, for example, which is in everything and these forever chemicals, which are in so many things, they don't help the issue. And it's like, oh, how crazy are you going to make yourself just because you're avoiding you know, oh, I can't buy a plastic bottle of water, even though I'm dying of fucking hydration. It's like, where are you going to draw the line? Anyway, so men's testosterone, though, this is really important. Men's testosterone levels since the 1980s have declined about 1% per year. This means that, for example, a 60-year-old man in 2004 had testosterone levels 17% lower than those of a 60-year-old in 1987. 1% per year, maybe you're like, oh, it's not that much. That is fucking huge. How many years has it been since 1980 to now? 1% a year. That is a huge decline of testosterone, right? 23% less than the same man in 1980. It's not okay. It doesn't help that society is all like, oh, toxic masculinity and making men feminine. A podcast episode for another time, although I've talked about it 10 million times in the different episodes. Men these days also have too much testosterone in their body because of these xenoestrogens and not enough testosterone, right? So not only do you feel like you're dealing with feminine-minded men, you're also feeling like they couldn't protect a predator if you need them to. So it's really important for any men listening that they start to focus on doing things that are going to also lower their estrogen and boost their testosterone. So they need to be flushing their liver out. They need to be making sure their digestive system is good so they actually poo all of that detox estrogen from their liver. They actually need to make sure they poo it out, same as us. They need to be going to the gym. They need to be going and like doing sport competitions with their guy friends because these things boost testosterone. I notice the immediate shift in my fiance when he leaves the house and then comes back from playing a tennis match. I literally can feel the testosterone increase from going and beating or trying to beat, he's a really good tennis player, so he often beats, but trying to beat his opponent. And I'm like, yes, go play the tennis, boost that testosterone, get the sperm going. 
That's what I'm doing, right? Internally, I'm like, go, go. Yep, you want to play three times a week? Do it. Go to the gym. Yes, yes. You want him to be boosting his testosterone. A man with the right amount of testosterone is a healthy man, not an unhealthy man. If, for the ladies, back to women, if, for example, you don't ovulate, it could be because you have excess testosterone, which also then causes a progesterone deficiency. So go into testosterone for the ladies. Women need testosterone in order to feel confident 100% and to feel sexy and to have a libido, but too much of it causes problems. However, the life that we're living in today, this modern society, means that like I've spoken about before, many of us have these constant unconscious stresses and they increase our androgens in our body due to the stress. Testosterone is an androgen due to the stress. The catch-22 of all this is that excess androgens can cause weight gain. It can cause acne. It can cause lowering of your voice. It can cause lack of ovulation. It can cause a lot of things when a woman has too much testosterone. And being overweight can then actually cause an excess of androgens. So like I've spoken about with the whole food situation, the hormone situation can get you stuck in this cycle, right? When you're overweight, you can then have excess androgens and the excess androgens then can cause you to not ovulate, which then puts you back into then you have access. It just kind of is a vicious cycle, which is why it's really important that when you're focusing on healing your health, you aren't just focusing on one thing. Because if you're focusing on trying to balance your hormones, let's say, and focusing purely on hormones, but you haven't focused on the fact that you're holding on to all this grief, maybe you're not losing weight because half of the weight is grief. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's, hence, it's important to be looking at multiple things at one time it just becomes easier. I think that it's a much faster way to get results because you're not like, okay, I spent six months trying to heal my hormones or I spent one year trying to heal my hormones. They're still fucked. Now I'm going to go to somebody else because a lot of these things, you want to be working on them collectively because you because the grief is causing you to have hormone issues. The hormone issues are causing you to then be overweight. You being overweight is causing you to feel shit about yourself. So then you're eating bad foods. Can you see how that's just like, it's just everything is fucking connected. So let's make the one thing very clear though. Body fat is needed. I'm assuming we all know this. Body fat is needing. Women need body fat more than men, right? If a woman doesn't have enough body fat, she will not get her period. She will not ovulate because her body won't feel like she has that extra fat often around her hips, her thighs, her bum to be that plan B if there was a famine and she had to feed her baby because she was pregnant, right? So women need body fat. You cannot, ladies, this is like a super important point. You cannot and should not be trying to get a flat stomach like a man because you have a fucking womb. Your stomach will change, especially on the side angle, throughout your cycle. So your stomach might look a little bit more flat right after you finished your period, but come the end of your luteal phase before you're about to start bleeding, you might notice that the bottom of your stomach is a little bit more protruded. Because your womb is full of blood. So now your womb has expanded a little bit. It's a little bit inflamed because it has all this blood in it. You're about to stop bleeding. Maybe you do have some inflammation down there, right? Maybe there's too many prostaglandins. So you've got a little bit of inflammation. Hence, you got a bit of period pain, whatever it is. You should not be trying to get rid of that. I mean, get rid of the period pain, but you should not be trying to have a flat stomach all the time throughout your cycle. You know, I was looking at my... um my period out before I put this on my Instagram story. And I realized that with the way my cycle is now, obviously it's shifted just like by one day or half a day for the last couple of months. And I, cause I went to go check it. I was like, is my period now falling on my wedding? Our wedding? <laughs> it is the, if, if everything stayed the same, I would get my period on the day of our wedding and my period's like clockwork. So I looked at that and I was like, fuck no. And you know what? I wasn't even like, fuck no, because I don't want to be bleeding on my wedding day. Like, I don't want that. It's more about energy levels. But it's also about the fact that with the outfits that I'm wearing prior to the day of the wedding, so in the, at the very end of my luteal phase, I would like for my, I would like my body to be that post period body, right? And this isn't me not loving my body if I was in my luteal phase, like I don't care. But like I just said before, the bottom of my stomach where my womb is does protrude more than if I just finished my bleed or even if I was midway through my bleed. And so I would prefer if possible to not be wearing a tight dress, for example, a couple of days before my wedding and then have to worry about that. I think about these things because I'm just honest with myself. Knowing your cycle and 
just allowing yourself to accept your body as it is in every phase of your cycle. I personally think it's one of the best things that you can do as a woman. So it should, just to be really clear, ladies, your body shouldn't change that much during your your cycle because if you're getting like major water retention or major bloating, that's a sign of a hormonal issue. But I've I've had a few women that will ask me this, more so clients, and it's made me aware that we are not educated of the fact that a man does not have an extra organ in the bottom of his stomach that he has to fit in. Ladies, you do, right? So whilst he can have literally flat, flat abs, in my opinion and in my very professional opinion with knowing a woman's cycle and knowing hormones and all this stuff, ladies, don't aim for that. You can want to have a toned stomach. You could want to have all the things. Yes, vibes. I love feeling toned. I love being toned. I love doing my Pilates. I love doing all that. But I'm also really honest with myself that the few days before my period, if I look at if I look at the side of my body in the mirror, my stomach's going to protrude a little bit more than right after my period. That's just fucking honesty, right? Self-honesty and self-acceptance is just, that is the key to loving yourself. Okay. So let me explain this to you. Uh, just sorry, to go back onto the excess fat thing or the body fat, sorry. Obviously, when you have excess body fat outside of your normal, your body's normal, it isn't necessarily good. And you probably do want to address it. I'm assuming you're listening to this episode because you do want to address it. And obviously, every single woman is different, but these are really important things to know because often, when we see this kind of, you know, bloody positivity shit on Instagram, it is so independent of all of these other factors. It co- It's like these people are completely oblivious to the fact that when you're eating the donut or when you're overweight, the flow on effect is fucking massive, fucking massive. And the best thing that you can do for yourself is get your body to a healthy body weight. I've talked about this before. And I actually had a girl recently DM me, which is what then inspired me to do this episode. Obviously, I've lost weight, right? I'm not going to beat around the bush with that. I've lost weight. If you have seen any recent Instagram posts or heard any of my recent podcasts, essentially to kind of quickly, wow, what was that word? Quickly paint the picture. I was this weight and, well, not this weight actually, because I haven't weighed myself in years, but I was this size, I would say before my ski accident. For those of you that know, I had a really horrendous ski accident a few years ago, 2017, that put me in a wheelchair for three months. I then had the following four surgeries from that ski accident. I had to learn how to walk again. It was a very, very traumatic time, not just physically, but also mentally for me. I mean, it was a catalyst in my journey and in my story, but it was really, really damaging to my physical health. My lymphatic system was completely not working. I developed cellulite all through my stomach and all through one side of my body because I wasn't moving. My dad used to sit at my bed or the end of the sofa and he would pump my foot as though I was walking to try and get the blood pumping through my body because I would get such bad pain through one side of my body because my limp, my lymphatic system wasn't working. When you're walking, there's these lymph nodes at the bottom of your feet in a different place of your body. But when, sorry, when you're walking, by pressing your foot down, it pumps the blood and the fluid back up your body. And you want that because it creates circulation. Hence, you'll notice that if you sit in bed for a long time because you're really sick, for example, your circulation isn't as good, it's because you're not walking. The walking is really important and that movement for circulation. I obviously couldn't do it. I was in a wheelchair for three months. I was on the longest list of drugs I've ever seen. I remember still seeing the piece of paper on the kitchen island bench of the um, house that we were currently in. We were on a ski trip when this happened. And it was a bullet point list, the whole A4 page down of drugs. I don't remember a lot of the time. There's videos and whatnot. I did a recent Instagram reel about it. If you didn't see it, you can scroll through and you'll find it. or We'll link it below. Um, I don't remember a lot of it because I was so high on drugs, like on painkillers. It was a seven hour surgery. They had to cut my muscle off my bone. They had to, there was nerve damage because they had to cut through a nerve, obviously to cut the the muscle off my bone. And it was a very, very intense and long recovery. I then got an infection in it because one of the stitches didn't dissolve. And then I had to have another surgery. There was a pile of complications. My knee wasn't healing properly because the doctor locked my leg brace in the wrong position. Anyway, and so then I had to get more um, 
surgeries to try and like break through all the scar tissue. It was a lot. As you can imagine, and if any of you have been through a really traumatic physical experience like that, that's not even the hard part. The hard part is the rehab. The hard part is crying in a gym that's a public place because you are in so much pain because you are mentally exhausted because you feel like your body is betraying you. The hardest part for me was really that because it's like I knew what I wanted my body to do, but it physically couldn't do it. I had chronic pain through my leg from where all of the metal was placed. So I eventually got the metal out because I couldn't even do a squat or a hip bridge without being in like excruciating pain. And so as a result of all of this, as you guys are learning from today's episode, and we're going to keep going, as a result of all of this, as you can imagine, I gained weight, right? And it wasn't that I really got necessarily very overweight or anything like that. It was all a stress response. It was all a result of my hormones getting a bit out of whack, my stress response being completely dysregulated, the trauma, the grief, the the stress that my body was physically holding on to. It was all of that. And this is why it's important that I tell, tell you this. I was eating the exact same thing. Honestly, I was eating healthy up then. I was having plenty of downtime. I was meditating. I was doing all the right things. But it wasn't until I was out of that situation where I was able to fully re-regulate my nervous system that I healed all this. I started losing the weight when I was living in London towards the end of living in London because I'd settled into a home. I was doing rehab. I was eating well, like I was creating routine and whatever. And I was learning how to regulate my nervous system. And then when I moved to New York, it continued. I was home. I was in my home, the place that felt like the most home to me. I grew up in New York. I was with my friends. I was making new friends. I was in my dream apartment. I bought, like I had jelly with me. Like I was living my best life. Then I met my man and it took everything to a whole new level. It created a sense of safety that I hadn't had in years because I'd been living on the other side of the world with no family around me. It created another layer of safety. We then obviously left New York and we moved to Atlanta. I now brush my teeth looking at the forest rather than brushing my teeth, hearing the honking of sirens, the honking of taxis, hearing sirens and looking at buildings, which is stressful. Like our nervous system does not like to look at these straight lines. It likes to look at nature. All of these things just compounded and it takes time, right? Which is why I'm also not about this quick fix of losing weight because the reality is, is that there isn't a quick fix. If you want though to feel like you can eat what you want within reason and go to Italy and eat gelato for two weeks and not gain weight, this is the work that's important because you have then brought your body to a place of safety, full health, equilibrium, its center. And so from that, you're not worried about, oh my God, if I eat one gelato, one scoop of gelato, is it going to throw everything off the rails and I'm going to have to diet for a week? You don't have to think about that because you're not in this yo-yo diet. You're not doing these extremes. Your body is actually just, it's normal. So you know what, ladies, this has been a long episode. What are we up to? And, and gentlemen, we're up to 50 minutes. Okay. I'm going to cut this episode here and we're going to have a part two because I could honestly keep going on for another half an hour. And in part two, I'm going to go through your nervous system and how that is really important for your journey of healing your weight and that and healing your, your health and losing weight if that's your goal or getting to a healthy weight, which kind of then relates to everything that I just told you about my ski accident and just my journey of this. Um, it'll be a shorter second episode. So we might even release it in the same week. So just keep your eyes out. But that will be the next part of this, right? So I, I really hope that you guys have gotten a lot out of today's episode already, which is learning all of these things. Just to give you guys a quick recap, because Sarah's like, where are you? We have a meeting. Uh, so the, the three things that we've talked about today, the three main areas that you need to look at is energetic, physical, and hormonal. Those, those, the, those are the three main areas we've spoken about today. The fourth main area is then your nervous system and stress, um, which we will get into in the next episode. Okay. All the links below, all the links are below of things that I've mentioned today. Thank you, Olivia, for doing that. And I really hope this episode was helpful. Please make sure that you share the episode if you guys haven't already. And if you leave a written review, send us a screenshot, and then we will send you a little gift in return. I appreciate all your support, everybody. And I hope this episode has been really helpful for you. So I will see you in the next one.